Good morning, everyone. Um, and I'm really sorry for the late start. Sometimes technology fails you. I'm really pleased to be here and thank you so much to the organizers. Um, my name is Yvonne Akisoya, as I'm sure perhaps you all know, Mayor of Freetown. And I'd like to just share some thoughts with you um, and experiences with you on our very practical approach to urban development, the transform Freetown story. So um, Freetown is the capital city of Sierra Leone with a population of about 1.2 million people. Although during the day that often goes up to about 1.5 as we have a lot of um, workers coming into the city from the urban area, the suburban areas, uh, for the Western area district, which in the map is the what's mostly in green um, towards the edges of that green. What's our story? Our story is that starting with the Civil War, which began in 1999, ended in 2002, we saw an explosion in the population of our city, moving, increasing by about two and a half times. Uh, this has meant that we're now one of the most densely populated cities in the world. But as you can see from the geography, we are also uh, constrained in terms of growth because the green you see are mountains. Um, so growth is either up the mountains or into the sea. With the population growth continuing to um, increase and an expected 500,000 more people by the end of this decade, that puts severe pressure on the built environment, on infrastructure, but also on the natural environment. What we've seen in the last 10 to 15 years is the growth of about 74 informal settlements, what would more um, or less pleasantly be described as slums. We've also seen a really, really negative impact on the service delivery of basic things such as sanitation, water, emergency services, with now at the time of my coming into office in 2018, only 21% of solid waste and 6% of liquid waste being collected. When you say that in numbers, in statistics, it may not come across as dramatically as it actually is. That really means that the stuff that we produce from our bodies, um, whether directly or through, um, through the trash cans, remains in communities with terrible health consequences, uh, as well as um, economic impacts. All of these burdens could not be described without us also touching on what this has meant for the natural landscape. We've lost over 50% of forest cover in the city and its environs over this time period. And that has made us much more susceptible to natural disasters like floods and landslides. And in the photograph you see behind you, um, this was the Motome landslide, which happened on the 14th of August, 2017 with the loss of over a thousand people in under five minutes. So what is Transform Freetown seeking to do? It is seeking to address this myriad of problems, recognizing that one of the major drivers of this is rural urban migration, something in respect of which we have less control because that's very much a national issue. There's gotta be investment outside of the capital so that there's less of a draw to the capital. But that notwithstanding, within the capital, what do we do with the situation before us? And that is Transform Freetown. A comprehensive plan to address these challenges by putting them into four clusters or putting our responses into four clusters, resilience, human development, healthy city and urban mobility. And what's important is that those four clusters translate into 11 priority sectors. Within resilience, not surprising from what I've said, environmental management is right at the top of the list. And this speaks to climate change as well as climate adaptation because climate change is happening around the world. It's being exacerbated in Sierra Leone, but even in Freetown, but even without that, we already are suffering the consequences of climate change on a global, that's happening at a global level. Uh, urban planning and housing, because as I said, if your biggest problem is unplanned growth of a population, part of that solution has got to be how you plan the city, how you manage that urban environment. 
revenue mobilization, I came into a city in 2018 and, and just by way of a little bit of background, um, I've never been in the public sector before. My background is private sector, um, but there, there was a recognition that I had a sort of eureka moment, if you will, um, back in 2018, which 2017 rather, the year of the, of the campaign, which followed my experience during Ebola and my experience in working on the post Ebola recovery with the government of Sierra Leone. I recognize that if you don't fix the public sector, the private sector space is never going to be what it needs to be in order for you to, in order for growth um, and wealth creation to be enabled. So revenue mobilization is speaking to not just the recognition of what I just referred to, but more specifically to the fact that the city itself needs to generate revenue in order for it to sustain interventions. When I came in in 2018, the city's revenue collection was the equivalent of $1.25 per capita. Um, and that begins to give you a sense of what is not possible by way of delivery of services to residents, whether those are direct basic services, such as what we talk about on the human development and healthy cities, or it's in terms of that enabling environment um, in our conversations in the clusters of resilience and urban mobility. So moving then to human development, here we look at education as a city, we have devolved to us responsibility for primary and junior secondary schools. That would be the equivalent, I guess, of year three in the UK, um, about age 13, 14. Um, we also have skills, well, skills development is something that we've chosen to focus on because um, having an education but not having skills um, still makes you unprepared for the workplace. And moving beyond that, where are the jobs? They've got to actually, in a very deliberate way, look at job creation. And we chose to do that with, with tourism as our focus because of the great potential the city has, but also some of the constraints that we have by way of an, a space for, when I say space, I mean, you know, good policies, um, energy provision, which would enable the growth of manufacturing. It's not something that, uh, these are not things, energy is not something devolved to council. These are not things we can control, but we are able to promote the growth of tourism um, and Freetown is one of the most beautiful cities in spite of our challenges and tourism is something that we have great potential for persons with disability because no one should be left behind um, and in that same vein this human development piece has women and girls um, as as you see running along the side um, as a lens through which we look at all of human development we move then on to healthy cities health water, sanitation. I touched on the challenges with sanitation um, in the beginning when I was giving the background to the city, 6% of liquid waste, 21% of solid waste, and what the implication is for that. Um, and of that on water and health, an incredibly high maternal mortality rate um, and very, very high incidence of malaria and non-communicable diseases such as hypertension and diabetes. Water, 47% of the population without access to running water. Um, and then urban mobility, which is both a cluster and a sector in itself. A city cannot grow if a city cannot move. Uh, and so this is the framework, uh, the how, what are we going to do to transform our city? The who is everybody. Uh, and, and for us, this is an incredibly ambitious goal transformation of a city within the term of a mayoral uh, um, tenure, which is four years. There is no way you can do this without having everyone on board. And this for me is another one of the lessons that I learned through my role in the Ebola outbreak. Um, I, I had the privilege of serving, starting off volunteering and then um, being quickly over a short period of time asked to lead in the response um, the planning of the response. And if I learned anything from that experience, it was the importance of community ownership, the importance of all stakeholders having um, a role, all stakeholders feeling involved and all stakeholders having a space for their voices to be heard. So um, we have everybody on board and we went through a process which started with engaging 15,000 of, of our residents in the city um, 
to hear from them on these 11 sectors with some tweaks just to make it accessible, um, hear from them, scoring us one to 10. Where do you see the city in terms of delivering in these sectors in terms of affordability, accessibility, and accept, ac acceptability? We did not score. This is three months after I came into office. We did not score five, an average of five over 10 for any single one of these. Kind of reinforced what we knew already. But we then moved on to getting technical input into saying, well, what is our theory of change? What is our problem? How do we change it? And how do we know we've changed it? So we agreed as a city through sector working groups on 19 specific targets which are here on this screen, and which if you're interested in having more of a look um, at what we're doing in Transform Freetown, you can find that information on our website, www.fcc.gov.uk. So 19 specific targets against which we report every year. Um, and on Sunday or tomorrow, um, we'll be doing our pre-press pre conference release of the two-year report. Uh, and so we've got a year to go. What I thought I would do now very quickly, because I know we lost a lot of time at the beginning, is just to share with you how we are actually meeting some of these targets. So I'm gonna start with a target in revenue, um, target one, increase tax fold from 7 billion per annum to 35 billion by 2020. What did we do to do that? We geomapped the entire city. We used a satellite image or images and got those images of the city, measured the rooftops of every building. And I must start by saying that when I came into office, there were 30,000 properties on the database for a city of 1.2 million people. Um, we know that we have informal settlements and we know that not everybody in the informal settlements will be counted because those are not properties that we want to continue to allow to be in hazardous places. But that notwithstanding, 30,000 in a city of 1.2, the numbers in add up. So we geomapped the entire city. We did the satellite imagery. We measured the rooftops. We sent out enumerators over 70 or 80, you know, over 100 enumerators actually, um, out into the field to take the core data characteristics of each property in the city. We moved away from an area-based assessment method to a value-based. And what you see on the screen is an example of the property rate notice. This sounds like normal to somebody in the UK because when you get your council tax, it looks at it looks at different attributes and you're, you're placed into bands, um, bands geographically, but bands also by value of the property. In, when, you, when the starting point has been area-based, we first needed to take the step of identifying what features made sense to capture, capturing them, and then moving that onto a digital base. We, we successfully moved from 30,000 domestic properties to 97,000. And looking at the makeup of that, it wasn't a huge change um, for those who were already ratepayers, but it meant that we had two thirds of our city being requested to pay rates for the first time. But we were also telling them that by paying rates, we were going to be able to increase on service delivery. And we automated payments, a very important piece in all of this, um, which is part of a wider move into developing systems and processes to make the city more efficient. So on the screen, you see a dashboard um, and literally now payments made in the bank are automatically updated. And again, it might sound like, you know, uh, um, this is normal, but it wasn't. Uh, you were moving from paper-based, a ledger, um, and payments that you could not track to having a system which now allows every payment that's made um, to be tracked not only in terms of where it's being made, the ward, um, but also for it to be recorded and um, our actual against targets to be seen on my phone, on my laptop, on my iPad, along with other city officials um, on a real-time basis. This is critical for reducing corruption, for reducing inefficiency, but most significantly perhaps for incentivizing residents. As part of this process, we introduced a 
um, incentive scheme where now every ward gets to choose through a digital town hall process, and we're actually piloting it already, voting on WhatsApp on a town hall, you choose how 20% of the money that's collected in your ward is used by your ward. Very quickly, some other, some just some, another piece. Um, this is an example of um, both job creation and um, the sanitation targets where we have been able to create now over 800 jobs um, of young people working as micro waste collection enterprises uh, and very closely monitored but deeply supported helping them build businesses the plus side is having a much cleaner city and that that will continue to grow we have a very comprehensive waste management strategy which starts a behavior change and moves on to improving um, landfills technology is a big part of how we're approaching this so whether it's find me in freetown which is an app which allows any homeowner or anybody actually in the city to go onto their phone, see where they're, see for that, their location, what ward they're in, information about the ward, who their counselor is, but significantly a list of all the service providers um, in that ward for the collection of solid and liquid waste. Um, finally, Freetown, the tree town, again, just, very quick one, this is a, a very short uh, um, um, time because of the, the late start, but this is our commitment under resilience environmental management to plant a million trees in the city and thereby increase vegetation cover by 50%. We are not just planting trees, but we're growing them. So um, this has involved creating tree stewards. Anybody in the city was able to become a tree steward, tree growers. We've hired 553 or thereabouts young people who have responsibility for monitoring and tracking the trees. Every one of the trees has is tagged. It's uploaded into a customized tree tracker app um, so that we can report on, on a constant basis. And we the, the intention was to plant a million trees in over two growing seasons um, because of we were able to raise funding to plant the first 450 in the last rainy season, which um, was June to October, but there were delays in the disbursement of the World Bank funds that had been approved, um, delays uh, on the part of government, and we did not actually receive the funds until October, uh, which was pretty much in the beginning of the dry season. That notwithstanding, of the 450,000 trees that we had plant to, to, to plant, um, only 249,000 um, survived that long delay, but we have planted them and we are tracking them. And at the moment there's 247,000 being tracked. And we're working now with an impact investment strategy to make it possible for people to purchase tokens as carbon offsets to help us raise the funding we need to get the additional 700,000 trees into the ground. And if I could just quickly say as well, in terms of challenges to urban, urban development, challenges to city, city leadership. And one of the things which I didn't mention is that this wonderful system that we described for property rates was not allowed to be implemented. The government, the, uh, the Ministry of Local Government um, raised concerns and said that there had to be national guidelines. Um, and so the whole system was put on hold. Uh, it is currently still on hold. Um, so we've gone a year without revenue, without being able to collect revenue. But I think this is from the perspective of economic students. Um, this speaking about Transform Freetown, speaking about the challenges that um, we seek to address in, in developing an integrated and comprehensive approach to those challenges, having targets, working with all stakeholders. I think what, what is always necessary to remember is that um, Ceteris Paribus does not always hold. All things are not always equal and you can have situations as one does where political, in, uh, political I'm trying to find the right word, political interruptions um, can actually have a really detrimental impact on service delivery and um, transformation. But every problem has a solution. And this is where working, broadening that stakeholder base, having international partnerships, um, ensuring that we take the approach 
which says that whatever we do, and this is a sort of a global phenomenon, so I'm just gonna close on this point, that whatever we do in one part of the world affects what's going on in other parts of the world. Um, and this is a message that myself and others in city, city leadership are continuing promoting within the structure of um, the Bret Bretton Woods financial institutions and others, financing needs to come to cities in order for us to de deliver on sustainable development goals and make these transformations possible. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Mayor Aki Sawyer. That was really interesting. Um, it was particularly... Sorry? I was cut off at 11.45, oh, sure. That's fine, that's fine. We'll just uh, conclude by saying that it was really interesting to hear this from you because I think as citizens and inhabitants of cities, we often take it for granted that our cities are functioning and progressing, but actually there's so much work behind the scenes from, from mayors like you to make our cities function and progress. So thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you very much for having me.